Pat Now on Try today. I'm just uh, so pleased and honored to have this uh, next guest with us. He is a world-renowned uh, uh, physician and uh, Jay Paul, our director, let's see, uh, Dr. Douglas Jeffrey. He is at Advanced Neurology and Pain, a cornerstone healthcare practice, and has an article coming out soon, I believe, in the New England Journal of Medicine. Is that correct? That's correct. We'll be publishing the results of a phase three trial of a new drug, 4MS, called Laquinamode. Okay, I want to learn more about that, and uh, but let's let's start out first and just say for people that and everybody's heard of MS and they've heard of multiple sclerosis, but give me a quick thumbnail description. What is it? Okay, MS is an inflammatory demyelinating disease of the central nervous system. So in short, what happens is that the immune system mounts an attack on myelin or the ner the fi the fiber that covers neurons. And this is not an overnight thing? No, uh, this is an ongoing, long-term, chronic Gradual, process. Which is why, the, 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 of course, the story of the famous uh, baseball player Lou Gehrig with ALS uh, would, would gradually lose his ability to grip the bat, and that's what he first noticed, and that's not unusual, right? No, that would not be unusual. Most MS patients present with a lot of constitutional symptoms like fatigue, difficulty with memory, problems with bladder function. And then eventually what happens is some of this, these foci of inflammation strike a strategically important location such as the optic nerve or the spinal cord and they'll lose vision or develop weakness in so their these extremities. So collateral, these collateral effects are, are, are what really is, is so devastating. Who's at risk for MS, do you think? Um, actually, just about everybody's at risk for MS. So the average age of onset is between 15 and 50. But I've had patients who started with their MS as young as three years old. I didn't know and I've that. had their patient patients who started with their first attack at the age of 65. So it can really affect a very broad range of individuals. Do we, you know, I know this is going to sound like a redundant question because we started out saying what it is, and we didn't rehearse this, so I mean, I'm, I don't want to put you on the spot, but why is that? I mean, why can all of a sudden a 60-year-old person be stricken with it? <clears throat> it's a very good question, and, and I don't think anybody really knows the answer to the question. So usually it's a disease which starts in younger people, but occasionally it does start late, and occasionally it starts very early. Why it starts, when it starts, we don't know. What we do know about MS is that there's a very strong genetic predisposition, and then something in the environment has to act on that genetic predisposition in order to you bring You mean you're more likely, just like with breast cancer and other things, are you telling me that if your father had MS, that you're more likely to get it, or does it skip generations, or how do you know? Um, if your father had MS, you are more likely to get it. So if you look at the general population, the risk is about one in a thousand. If you have a first-degree relative who has MS, your risk jumps to one in a hundred. How do you know for sure they have it? I mean, how do you diagnose it? Okay, MS is a clinical and radiologic diagnosis, and there are also other ancillary testing you can use to confirm a diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. So we say that somebody has multiple sclerosis when they have lesions which occur at different locations in the nervous system at different periods of time in the absence of a more likely explanation. And that is really the, over, the overriding um, principle in the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. Can it be prevented? No. And I didn't like that answer. It was short, and I didn't, I didn't like it. Um, but what, I mean, what can be done, though? <clears throat> MS is a very treatable disease. We have medications now which are more effective than we've ever had before for MS. We can do more for MS patients than we ever could before in history. So I tell my patients that my job is to make sure that when they're 90, they're as good as they are today. And that, indeed, is my job. And so that is what I'm going to do or die trying. And we have medications which are effective enough in this day and age that we can really be very successful in the majority of patients, especially if we get them early. Now, the medicine you're writing about, or the treatment uh, modality you're writing about in the journal, the upcoming journal article, is that <clears> something <throat> that you feel you're optimistic that that could curb or, or uh, cause longer periods of remission, or what, what's the objective? Um, in this particular, this particular drug, we're very optimistic that this drug will have true neuroprotective effects. And that's something different because within, with MS, there's two different aspects of treatment. So there's neurologic damage, which really can't be undone. And then there's inflammation. So we have drugs now which can very nicely suppress the inflammation. But to try to undo the damage or prevent um, ongoing degenerative damage from occurring is where this drug may really have a big role. There's so much we could talk about. I'd really like to get you back if you can spare the time. I know you're busy, but let's uh, wrap up by just putting on screen www.cornerstonehealth.com, as we always do, and that gets you some general information. But, uh, of course, Dr. Jeffrey with Advanced Neurology and Pain, and you can find him there. Please come back, will you? Thank you. Thanks, Doc. All right, we'll be right back.